Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 26th. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Our topic today is moving students from digital citizenship to digital leadership with our special guest, Jennifer Casatod. And Susie's going to introduce Jennifer and ask the newbie question. Oh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I am so thrilled that Jennifer is our special guest today. I have known her for a couple years, mainly through Voxer, but I feel like I really know her. Um, she's been an important contributor to librarians, to teachers in general, to administrators, and she's probably maybe my best Canadian friend. So it's great that we're truly international. Um, she has throughout the time that I've known her, promoted the positive use of looking at how we can help create student leaders. She is a learner, teacher, librarian, mom, and author of the book, Social Media, Moving Students from Digital Citizenship to Digital Leadership. And it's really neat. Do a search on uh, Twitter, or there's a Facebook group you can belong to. There's a lot of great buzz from this book. And it's important enough, she was picked up by Dave Burgess Pud and that's, I think that's important too. He knows how to pick great ones. She's going to tackle a few courageous conversations about the use of social media in school, as well as highlight elements of what she defines as digital leadership. I think you may look at uh, digital citizenship in a completely different way after hearing from her. So without further ado, we want to move on to the newbie question. And she's going to to answer this as she goes through her presentation. So Jennifer, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I appreciate your patience as I work through um, Blackboard. It's my first time in here, and I have to say I had a couple of issues getting in here. So um, what is your, how do you define social media? And I'm actually going to defer my answer uh, to my presentation. So how does this, I'm not sure how this works. Um, do you want to put your answer in the chat, and then um, when I bring it up in the conversation, we'll come back to it? And I want to thank you, Susie, so much for that uh, introduction. It means a lot to me that it's from you, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. All right. So um, as uh, Susie and Lori and Peggy have already mentioned, my name is Jennifer Casa Todd, and you can find me online in lots of places. Um, jcasa.todd.com is where I blog, on Twitter at jcasa Todd. And what I've done, I know it's not typically what you do, um, but I've included a presentation link for you. Um, and so if you want to jump into a different tab using a URL, um, I think that would be great, um, and thank you for putting the presentation link in there, um, Peggy, as well, um, because then you can sort of uh, save it. Uh, you can make a copy and make notes in it as we go if you like, um, though that may take away from you using the chat, but just so you can have it. Oh, no, need permissions. Okay, I will make sure I get permissions. Can I also ask, um, how do I advance the slides? Are you uh, doing that for me? Um, Jennifer, there's, there's an arrow that points to the right next to where it says page 13 that goes forward. Oh, the beautiful. Okay, beautiful. All right, so let's get started. Um, a little bit more about me. So I would like to uh, share that my most important role is mom of two teenagers. One is graduating in 2018, and one is graduating in 2020. So they keep me grounded, and there is absolutely nothing that I can do that is actually not lame, according to them. I don't know how many of you parent teens. Um, but that is it. Um, I'm also a new teacher librarian. I started last year. Um, and before that, I was a, a program resource teacher for literacy and a literacy consultant with the York Catholic District School Board. 
So I worked in that role um, supporting teachers with assessment, uh, differentiation, a whole bunch of different things. Yes, teachers, librarians rock. Um, and uh, I was also very fortunate to be able to lead and learn with uh, a team for our Journey 2020 uh, project. And there is where um, I really encourage teachers to become connected educators. Um, I worked using social media and technology um, with teams from 108 of our, of our schools. It was an amazing opportunity. I am also uh, a learner. So I'm uh, currently studying, I'm doing a master's in curriculum and technology at UOIT here in Ontario. And um, I learned from all of you, so many uh, here I recognize from Twitter. So that's sort of a little bit about me. And I would like to share with you sort of how I came to even uh, being here today and writing this book. And I'm going to invite you to answer this question. And that is, what social media are you on and what will I learn about you when I go there? So maybe uh, write your answer in the chat as if you were answering an interview question. What social media are you on and what will I learn about you when I go there? Maybe just a moment. Don't think too hard about this because remember, imagine this is a, a uh, an interview question. So Twitter for PD, that's what social media you are on and what will I learn about you if I go there? Uh, post about educational things, passionate about what to share. Thank you, Paula. Okay, <laughs> lots of food, Susie, thank you. Okay. Oh, I'd love to hear more about the VHSG project. Okay, show that I think what is valuable in education. All right, so um, parent gardener, where you tend to be politically. Okay, so and let me give you a little bit of background to this. So um, given my background, you can understand that if I was given this interview question, I would be able to answer it no problem. You would be able to look um, to see that I was very much uh, I'm passionate about student voice. I love to share my, my learning, my reflections on my blog, um, that I use Twitter for education um, and to celebrate others, right? Like I have such a great answer to this. The problem is, this is a question that my daughter was asked at a job interview and she does not have and she didn't have a good answer to this. And this really changed everything for me um, because it was a, a moment in my, <laughs> in my momhood, which I like to say is, was a complete mom fail for me. Um, and the reason it's a mom fail is because I recognized at that moment that I had actually squashed my daughter's passion. Now, she really wanted to do lots of things with social media, but I was so concerned about all the terrible things I'd heard, right? Um, the the cyberbullying, all these horrible things. And as a mom, I was very careful to make sure that she had a neutral to non-existent digital footprint, that her face was never online. And one, one thing in particular stands out to me. So we went to um, to Boston and she wants to be a marine biologist. And so she said, Mom, can I do a vlog, which is a video blog? And I said, absolutely, except you can't have your name or your face on it. And you can imagine that she wasn't really interested in doing this anymore. So what really changed for me um, it was this question, first of all, but then George Kuros, who's uh, a mentor and now very good friend of mine, he was with us um, at our district, and, and he's all, always very inspiring. But at nighttime, I went to a parent session with him, and he talked about digital leadership. And digital leadership is using the vast reach of technology, especially the use of social media, to improve the lives, well-being, and circumstances of others. And so I went, oh my gosh. Um, I think what was really most significant to me about this is he was talking about teens who were doing this. So he talked about um, Connor Swove, who's a, a student who created a, um, a secret Instagram account to compliment others, and Jeremiah Anthony, who created Westing Bros on um, Twitter, who also set out to compliment people and completely changed the culture 
around them. And I thought, wow, what is, this is incredible. These are kids. And so it really led me on my quest. Um, to, to first of all further refine what digital leadership could be in school. Um, and I love this visualization that uh, Sylvia Duckworth did to me for me when I first blogged about it. And I'm, I, in school we really focus on ethical and responsible use of technology and I think that's really, really important. There are so many elements to digital citizenship that are really important. But what we don't do enough of inspire kids to lead using social media. Um, you know, we, um, and, and part of that when I started to look at these kids was that they were learning and sharing their learning. They were empowering others with no voice. Um, they were promoting important causes and they were really being a positive influence on others. And I found tons of kids. And really that's where my book and my work started um, because I felt like these students needed to be heard and celebrated. There were teachers out here, um, you know, doing amazing things to empower kids. All of these kids had a, a, an adult mentor um, that really supported them. And I thought, hey, can we as educators be that adult mentor and what's stopping us? from doing that. So with that in mind, uh, I have a three goals for us today. I would like to uh, instigate a few courageous conversations. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the fact that I don't really believe that social media is ruining the world. Um, the other thing I'd like you to take away uh, from here is knowing that social media actually needs to be part of teacher teaching and learning in 2017. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit more about digital leadership and uh, how that will help us change the trajectory in order to move to a new direction. So I hope that's okay and I look forward to seeing what you see, uh, what you say in the chat. So social media, despite what everyone seems to think and all the articles that are out there, I don't really believe that it's an instrument of mass destruction. In fact, it's the opposite. And this is where um, my answer to the newbie question comes in. Because social media, according to Dana Boyd, um, in it's complicated, is actually just a collection of, of network sites, uh, sharing video sites, blogging, microblogging, that allow participants to create and share their own content. Um, and Kara Carvey, in some of my studies I came across in the Encyclopedia of Social Media and Politics, talks about social media as anything that connects people in a large-scale conversation, exploration, and opinion sharing. And so think about that for a second, because there is nothing negative about that. Um, I get that we're afraid, but it really I think we have to remember that at every time where there has been huge technological change, there has been fear. I mean, when electricity was created, I'm pretty sure there was fear. This is one of my favorites. Um, I think, uh, like, it really did the speed train cause early premature tooth decay and baldness? Really? <laughs> so, and, and you know, among other things, I mean, the telephone was said to have had, uh, you know, be the most dangerous thing because it inhabit dwellings. So I think that there's definitely a fear of change, and I get it. Um, and I think that there are genuine fears too, right? Like there, there are fears, and, and, and this is why I think we seem to, per, to, to really focus in on the safe cyber safety um, and it's, it almost feels like that's all we do in school. Um, our digital citizenship programs really focus on cyber safety. How do we keep kids online? Almost as if we can scare them to be off the internet. Like look at this image. Like, I, I think what really drew me to this is look at this man's face and look at that girl's face. And I, I think that though there are real dangers, there can be real dangers, we also need to look at the online and offline world together uh, today because for so many of our students, so for so many of us, I'm old, like I've been teaching for 23 years, um, and so I think of an analog world and a digital world, and for so many students, um, that, that world is increasingly enmeshed. So we need to, to talk about safety for sure, but it, we really need to talk about safety overall um, and what, what differences are there online and offline. You know, I, I remember being really afraid that my kid was going to walk into someone's car um, because they offered her 
candy or, you know, said, here's my puppy, come look at it. But I didn't scare her to the point where she wouldn't leave her class or her our home. And I think we have to really think about what we're doing when we're just focusing on the fear narrative um, because we think social media is destroying the world. And and I and I know that cyberbullying is a part of that, right? So we believe and I, I've heard teachers in Edumatch, uh, Susie, you can attest to this as well. Um, schools who completely ban devices uh, because they're afraid that the minute they allow devices, then they are going to um, have a cyberbullying happen. And I have to share something, and, and that is that bullying has always existed. Um, this is a picture of me. It's, it's probably the only picture um, that I have um, because I've kind of destroyed all my other ones. And it's during a rite of passage. If you're Catholic, you might recognize um, uh, the uh, First Communion. Um, and I want you to pay attention to my eyes there um, because when I was a little girl, I had crossed eyes. Um, and the photographer spent I, an hour uh, trying to get a picture of me where my eyes didn't look so crossed. And of course, I couldn't wear my glasses in this picture. Um, and you can imagine how absolutely um, <laughs> horrible my childhood might have been because anyone who's different um, is bullied and I was bullied. Bullying has always, always existed and I remember moments where um, people who were bullying me really enjoyed the power of watching me be humiliated. And so uh, research, the research that I did uh, when I did a social media and education course um, actually talks about the fact that bullying still happens it face to face first, and that makes sense to me. But then it continues online. Um, but I think we have to listen to young Hannah Alper, who's starting grade nine, one of the students that I um, showcase in the book, who says, "Yes, we can do bad things online, but we can prevent them and do things that will help us change the world for the better." And how often do we give students the opportunity to do this um, when we're just shutting down opportunities for them? And so this is what I truly believe. I truly believe that social media can be used to build people up. It can be used to tear them down. That it's not the tool, but the user of the tool that makes the difference. And I know that when I was at home uh, with a concussion last year, my boxer group really kept me uh, sane. Um, they really lifted me up in a way that I, I, is not possible without it. So I really think we need to kind of think differently about this and really focus on a culture of kindness and empathy because that's really the only way to stop bullying. Um, it, uh, you know, banning the cell phones uh, does not stop it whatsoever. And so I also want to introduce you to young Olivia Van Lecce. And if you don't follow her, you need to follow her right now. Um, she is incredible. And I met her for the first time at the Digital Citizenship Summit in San Francisco. She uh, keynoted, if you can imagine, like just such a powerful message all around. And it wasn't until that evening that I discovered that the, action, the reason she got a Twitter account, her mother let her, was because she too was being very bullied, uh, was being bullied at home in her school. And I mean, I get why I was bullied. My mom even made my own clothes, like on top of everything else. But Olivia is so beautiful and so vivacious. And so um, for her, I think everything about her uh, led me to really rethink this whole cyberbullying thing um, because social media has been a place of joy for her. And her motto I have to share is screenshot block in bloom. So when she's online, she can actually shut down some of the negativity in a way that she was not able to do face to face. Um, her videos are an incredible inspiration. Um, and her mom is her mentor. And so that, again, brings back to can educators be mentors? I can't stop thinking about that. So the other thing that I, I'm learning, and, and that is that scholar Henry Jenkins tell us that we are shutting down opportunities that are meaningful for young people out of a moral panic response to technological and cultural change. So we could be using social media in such powerful ways, but we're not um, because we have this panic and we, I think we just need to get over it. And I think we need to empower students to become first responders and spend a lot of our time doing that, having conversations with kids about, you know, what, how can we be more positive online? And I love the first responders, um, which is what Matt Sos from I Can Help says. And he's pretty awesome. You should follow him as well. 
Um, and I think the other thing, we, the reason we ban uh, social media or we, is, is we have such a negative connotation to it. We really think that our students are way too connected. Um, look at this picture. This picture went viral. I don't know if you've seen this picture before. It went viral and it said something like, you know, uh, everything that's wrong with today's society because here are these kids in front of this beautiful piece of art and they're all looking at their devices. And so it really reinforces that idea that kids are not living, right, that they're in their own worlds on, and they're not recognizing the beauty around them. When in fact, um, in a previous picture that did not go viral, um, they are very much engaged in the art gallery. And so uh, this went viral um, for the wrong reasons, and the students were actually on an app doing schoolwork. So yes, they are researching that artwork. Thank you. Um, so I always think about that, and, and when I facilitated a connection between um, Fabiana Casala, who is from Argentina, and Ricky Mahala, who was at my school at the time. Um, they sort of talked with each other on Boxer and then uploaded their conversations to Padlet. And they had this ongoing conversation. Um, I mean, the kids would say, oh, are we talking to the Argentinians today? Um, and and I, the, uh, that, the blog post there that Ricky wrote was really interesting because she articulated what I had also um, come to believe and understand, and that is that students are very much connected to their friends online, but not necessarily connected to communities outside in the world, and how important it is for them to gain perspectives. And when we talk again about empathy, um, where do we get that? But it, I think it was, it's also interesting at this point to note that her class average um, in her, for her unit one test was seven. 71%. Um, but then after the students had these conversations with the students from Buenos Aires, her class average went up to 91% because it really meant something to them, these conversations. And so um, this is another uh, visualization that I'm so blessed that Sylvia Duckworth created for me, and that is the um, the positives to connecting our students to other classes, to experts, um, to authors, etc., cetera, um, and how important it is that in today's day and age we do that. And so that brings me to my next um, point, and that is that social media needs to be a part of teaching and learning today. And you're probably wondering, are you kidding me? How am I going to have time? I can't. I have so many things that I'm already trying to juggle. And what I say to you, it's the same thing that Ricky discovered, and that is that social media has the potential to actually make your curriculum come alive for your students in a way that it's not possible to do so otherwise. And a, a time and time again, there are examples in my own practice where I've seen this happen. And I love this. Um, if you've never seen it before, I got it from George Kuros' Innovator's Mindset, and it's by Bill Ferreter. And he talks about, um, you know, what do you want kids to do with technology? Because one of the things we're all doing is we're trying to, I don't know if the word integrate technology is um, the best way to say it, but, but we are trying to figure out where technology fits into our teaching and learning today. And so what I really love about this is, and, and you don't have to call it wrong answers and right answers, um, but certainly um, good and better answers. So think about the extent to which even once um, we can um, raise awareness or start conversations. We can help, help students make a difference and take action. Some of the things that I've uh, discovered is that kids are already doing this. And so even if it's just once, if we use social media once to do some of these things, I think that can be so incredibly powerful. And I think another person you have to follow is uh, Curran D. He's in grade four, and he makes such a valid point, and he says, my school says they give me digital access because we have Chromebooks. Think about that for a second. You know, is digital access the fact that we can now um, upload a, a you know, worksheet to Google Classroom. Um, Curran says we don't blog. My teacher doesn't tweet what we're learning. We don't get per to participate in mystery Skype through the global read aloud. And, and that is what really um, al allows for um, technology enabled learning today. And, and I love that and do follow him because they also have some really great ideas for getting involved. And earlier the question was, 
how do you deal with fake news? And I know as a teacher librarian, you know, I've created a hyperdoc around this. It's, it's a really important thing. Um, lots of students, according to a Stanford study, actually don't know the difference between a real article and sponsored content. And so I often think about my own kids and the fact that they get all of their news from their social media feeds. Literally, all of it. So, and, and we are so quick to say, oh no, we can't do that. Well, I would say, I think we need to start there. I need to say, so uh, one of the things we did with uh, a fake news unit is we said to the students, go to your social media feeds. What is one thing that you're reading that may or may not be true you're not sure about? And let's start there. And there's a, a perfect opportunity um, for these lessons about fake news to really come alive for them because it's real and relevant. And um, every language arts or English program also has uh, a media component. And it's so important today, um, to ha just as it was 20 years ago when I first started teaching um, media and English, that students understand that media is a construction. How many kids know that? Um, how many of them understand that they have special interests, that they have their own forms and conventions? Um, I think we really need to, to critique media, social media in particular, because remember, social media has the word media in it. Um, and also research supports the fact that when they're creating, they're coming to understand a lot of this as well. It's really, really quite important, and it fits in with every English or language arts curriculum. And so this is just a picture um, that my niece created using KidTube. And my nephew creates worlds in Minecraft, and he has a YouTube channel where he shares tutorials about them. My daughter, who's a teen, loves to create slime um, and loves to make face masks. And she's on YouTube all the time. And in fact, one of my, my daughter said the other day, Mom, you know, we rely very much on what um, other people, some of the YouTubers say before we buy a product. And that's an incredible shift. And so I think um, we really need to think about how digitally rich these students' lives are when they're not in school. And that needs to really have an impact on us. Um, because we have digital citizenship programs that are really excellent. Um, but unfortunately, they're taught in isolation. Um, they're taught as discrete units. Sometimes they're only taught by the media specialist. Um, and they're not really a part of what our everyday life is like. And so, I also caught, want you to think about the fact that so much of how we teach digital citizenship is on worksheets. So we have kids creating worksheets, and we have kids coloring footprints. But realistically, they have rich digital lives outside of the classroom. So then we wonder why there is a disconnect between what they do in school or what they think the expectations in school are and not. And, and I worry, because you could say, well, we could practice all of these digital citizenship um, things you know, using our closed environment. We have you know, an LMS where we could do all of this. And I would say that's really great, but I, my concern is there's a dichotomy between real life and school tools. Do kids know that they should behave the same way no matter what online tool they're using? So I think that that, that definitely, um, for me, um, suggests that perhaps we should at least use social media, even if it's just once, uh, K-12, um, rather than not using it at all. And I love this. I just wanted to include it. So this is what uh, Julie Millen, uh, again, follow her. She's awesome. Uh, Julie Millen by, uh, or accidentally left off the comment feature in her Google Classroom. And then some of the students started to share it inappropriately. And she said, hey, if you guys want to have a just for fun um, Google Classroom, we can do that. But then she brainstormed um, together with their students what they should or shouldn't be doing, or what they could or couldn't be doing. And that was really powerful for them. And then this Google Classroom for fun 
even though it's a closed environment, really then becomes a springboard for when they actually do use this. And I know that Diana Hale um, in the Toronto District School Board, she did the same thing when the students were about to engage in a Twitter, uh, classroom Twitter account. And so there, I, I'm not saying that we don't start with some of our closed tools, um, but we, do, we um, do need to, I think, move on. And with older kids, why aren't we asking kids to, have, to choose their own tool? Um, and whatever tool that might be, as long as they then justify it and reflect on whether or not they make the right choices, um, isn't that so very powerful? So this is something that I leave you with. And a lot of the, um, I know the theory of observational learning by Albert Bandura, as well as this Common Sense Media um, report, talks about how embracing a balanced approach to media and technology and supporting adult role modeling is actually recommended to prevent problematic use. We keep talking about the problems with social media, but what are we really doing in education to help? And I think, one of the, the honestly, um, the, the reasons for using social media among the many that I've already talked about really came alive for me when I met Aiden Aird. Now, Aiden Aird, a uh, now graduate, uh, I met him on Twitter and realized he was part of my district, actually. So I invited him to come and speak at a, um, an EdCamp event. And what is so incredible about Aiden, well, there are lots of things that are incredible about him, but the first thing um, that really struck me is that Aiden created a website called developinginnovations.org. And the sole purpose of that website was so that he could celebrate other kids. Like, that is so countercultural, right? Um, but what he did was he Googled himself and he realized that even though he was an inventor and was winning all these science fair projects, when he Googled himself, his, his eight-year-old hockey stats, stats were the first thing that came up. And so in a world where kids are Googled, we have Aiden, and then we have other students. Now, I work on the social media account for my school, and one student in particular comes to mind. And um, his pin, he's an exceptional leader. Um, he's a real, like, I just, just an amazing kid overall, really smart, really bright. Um, you know, he's going to do amazing things. But when you looked at his, his Twitter account, his pinned profile, um, his pinned tweet, rather, it made him look like a thug. And so I contacted him. I warred with myself about contacting him. And I said, you know, should I or shouldn't I? And I think I should. Um, and when I talked to him about it, I said, you know, you're such an incredible leader, but your online presence, your Twitter profile, you would never know that. And he said, oh. And so he said, oh, thank you so much. Um, and then he he deleted that tweet, and then he, I said, do you want me to help you sort of develop a more positive online presence? And he said to me, Miss, I wouldn't even know where to start. And to me, that's a tragedy, that we have students who are leaving our schools in grade 12, they're leaving our schools in grade 8 when they're 13 and they can use social media, and they are using social media, without a real sense of what does this look like and how can I um, leverage social media. And I think that what's so important about that is when you hear things like this, that students are using digital and social media professionally in an integrated and strategic way, they have an advantage. They're getting better jobs and better internships. And Aiden contacted me and said, I'm so excited. I got this incredible scholarship. Scholarship. And he said, and it's because of a connection I made on Twitter. Like, wow, there are so many kids in your schools, in your classrooms, who are doing amazing things. Um, do their online presence also reflect that? And isn't it time that we start to at least have conversations? Like, I don't feel comfortable with kids branding themselves because I think that whole, you know, you're you're a person, not a brand, um, but I do think that we need to start having conversations about this at every level. And so this is where I want to start to talk about digital leadership and, and what that new direction might look like. And I, I know that so many people now, and, and many of you even said that you have a class Twitter account. And one of the things that we've been told time and time again is, um, if you don't tell your story, someone else will, right? So show, I've seen incredible uh, class accounts where you're showcasing um, 
your things that are happening in your school, and I think that is great. But I also think that students need to become involved in the process. So this is something I use um, where I ask kids, you know, what does responsible use of technology look like? Um, let's brainstorm that together. But then that we move forward to actually using the tools. And the best way to do that for your 13 and under set, because as you know, they can't actually use social media on their own, is a social media account. And I've created this just with some questions um, and some ideas for us to, to sort of investigate why would we even have a social media account, right? So many of us have gotten on Twitter, and Twitter is a cool, sort of like a super awesome platform for educators, but not a lot of parents are on there. Um, so, you know, conversations with, with administrators and teachers about what platform should you choose, and I say, where are your students and where are your parents and grandparents? Um, maybe we need to start thinking about that um, when we're doing this. And I just want to share a couple of examples of what these class accounts could look like. So this is Stephanie Viveros' class at Curious kin Kinders. Um, and in Ontario, we have a huge focus on pedagogical documentation. And so her kids learn in kindergarten um, to take pictures of work that they're proud of, and then they could post it on their inquiry wall in the classroom, or they could upload it to the Google Drive folder, which would be shared with the parents. And so um, this, was, this was great. So she's building autonomy and empowering her kids to make decisions, reflect on their learning. And then she moved to a, uh, an Instagram account. And at first, um, what she did, which was, I think is so powerful, so she was asking these four-year-olds what should be private and what should be public. Imagine if we started doing that with our kids starting at four years old in the classroom. Um, and the other really powerful thing that started to happen is initially there were no pictures of faces of kids because the parents were a little bit reluctant to do this. Um, but as time went on, as she continued to share and the kids said, oh, I picked that picture, um, the parents not only were interested in learning more about Instagram, which is awesome, um, but then they felt more comfortable with their kids. They wanted to see their kids doing. And think about how it changes conversations at home, right? So now you're like, wow, I saw that they, you know, the, um, you guys were working with clay or whatever the, the case may be. Tell me a little bit more about that. And uh, Chopped on Teaching. So Kayla Delger does it a little bit differently. I don't know how she manages all three. I don't know that I would do all three, but she has... Um, a Twitter of the day, an Instagrammer of the day, and a Snapchatter of the day. But that's only after they, the, the students engage in a digital citizenship boot camp. And they dress up in camel, and then they get a certificate. So once they know how to be safe online, they then actually use the tools in order to be the tweeter, Twitter of the day, the Instagrammer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I think what's so powerful is having Riley Hansen in grade three say, I want to be proud of my social media accounts. How many of our kids could say this? How many of them are saying this? So I love it. And, and before I move on, what I should say is that um, she actually had a digital citizenship boot camp for parents as well because they were interested. And so that parent communication piece is huge. And this is Rob Canone, and he has classroom committees, so the kids rotate through different teams. And I think that can be very, very powerful as well. Um, and then the, a perfect case of high schoolers doing this is the Burlington High School Help Desk, where kids are not only uh, collaborating with their own teachers online, but they're reaching out to experts and app developers. And a product of this is uh, Timmy Sullivan, who now graduated, who says, if you present social media as a positive space, as a place where students can express themselves and connect with others, that's the type of of learning that you're going to see there. And so we've been so afraid to get online with our kids, but I think there's a lot um, of uh, actual uh, examples where this is working, so we should probably look at this again. So I've included a link to a Padlet, um, because I'm going to go through the next uh, few examples fairly quickly, but I want you to be able to have 
some of these ideas um, at your fingertips. And I also, it's a Padlet, so I'd love for you to contribute uh, some of your ideas as well. They're organized around the digital leadership elements, so learn and share learning, promote important causes, and be a more positive influence on others. Um, and then there is a link to not just the leader, uh, the student leaders that I mentioned in the book, but also some others that I continue to meet. It's hard to write a book because you actually have to stop writing, um, and this is such an ongoing conversation. Um, so when we talk about learning and sharing your learning, um, does your class account follow some, insp like, I know we follow inspirational educators, but are we inviting kids and showing, modeling what it's like to um, follow some really great accounts where they can learn, where they're not just looking um, at what entertainers are doing, because that seems to be the default on social media. And for older kids, math in the news, that was so good. They take like real um, news articles that have math, you know, sports statistics and whatnot, and create questions. Um, and for even the younger kids, this is what Brian Aspinall did. He said, what pattern does this produce? How do you know? And he posts that on Twitter, and the original tweet link is there, um, so that you're actually inviting kids to learn and share learning. And people are so fearful, right? But really, the answer here, how could you really go wrong? Like, what, what, what would they possibly say? Um, and then it, it uh, models risk-taking, too. Um, I don't have time to look at the, uh, for us to look at this, but uh, family book talk hashtag, um, there's a link to what he does there, as well as a link to the video on how to create book talks. And this is what Brad Gustafson does. Um, he invites families um, to share what they're reading together. And that is an incredible, to me, way to not just learn and share learning, but also build a community. He talks very powerfully uh, with his parents about um, learning, uh, using media as learning media, and I love that. Um, if you um, are on present mode in the presentation and you click on this picture, it will take you to a flip grid called Global Buddies with so many interesting opportunities to connect with kids from all over the world, um, and it's, it's just beautiful. If you're in high school and, again, you hyperlink, you, you click on that image, you are going to uh, find a global collaborative project that is being put on by my friend Barbara in Norway. Um, sh her project last year was incredible. Um, and so her, this one in particular, you're welcome to join as well. It begins in September. Um, and I don't have Tara Martin down there. I'm not sure if you could put Tara's uh, hash, um, Twitter handle here. but. Uh, Tara talks about book snaps and how you could basically do a close reading of text using the very fun filters in Snapchat. And you can share those on any account, whether it be your Instagram account, a Twitter account, a Facebook account. Recently, she talked about uh, gratitude snaps. Oh, that's awesome that she's presenting for you. She talked about gratitude snaps, and they did it for 30 days. But you know what? You can do gratitude snaps any time. Um, and Snapchat is... is is great for storytelling. So those are a couple of ideas as well. Promoting important causes, I just urge you to take a look at some of these students. Um, Braden is doing amazing work uh, to stomp out homelessness, as is Joshua Williams. Hannah Al Alper is an eco-warrior. She blogs. Uh, Mary, who is at Little Miss Flint, is uh, sharing um, the fact that in Flint there still is a water crisis, and she shares that. So do check out some of these kids. There's a link to an awesome table with more information about them. And I love this by Liz Radzicki, and she's talking about school as a place of participation. And really, this is what digital leadership is, right? Participation. And if you haven't engaged in the teach, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals, please take a look at the website, take a look at the uh, hashtag on Twitter um, and the handle on Twitter, because there are so many different ways to get involved. I think right now, um, one of the projects in the world's greatest lesson is around food. Um, and that's, that's a project that anyone can do anywhere um, to learn more about SDGs. Um, and then become a more positive influence in the lives of others. I've got to tell you, William Dwyer says when you, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so because I have a, uh, a digital leadership stance, everything I do is, you know, how can we be more positive? I have seen 
such positivity. Um, you know, even just creating a hashtag, this is Brad Gustafson's uh, hashtag where he builds community using a hashtag in his school. Um, I can help talk about a compliment wall that you physically have in your building, but then how about extending that to Instagram where you're, you're finding the, the Twitter handles of some of the students in your class or all of the students in your class and you're complimenting them as well. Someone said, and I haven't looked into this, but that Angela Maris has a a um, You Matter gram, uh, which I'd love to look more into, so if anyone has information on that, please put it in the chat. And then doodle a day, uh, Royan Lee is a Canadian educator, an Ontario educator, and he just created something called a doodle a day. And I thought it was so incredible um, because it just invited us to sketch and share our sketches. Um, he blogs about it actually and it's, it's just such an incredible testament to the fact that something so little um, can actually have a profound and positive effect on others. And uh, Miss McLeod, uh, is another, this is another example I'd like to share. When she heard about some of the devastating uh, suicides that were happening in a northern Saskatchewan school, in a First Nations school, they moved to action. Um, and so they created a uh, happy jar. Um, they sent out a Google form on Twitter and got people from all over the world, uh, five different countries, to respond. They cut them out and put them in there. And then they had a fundraiser to also um, bring them actual items. So think about the way um, social media can actually complement some of the real good um, that's happening in face-to-face -face situations in your school. And I think sometimes we, we preclude social media, but we have to stop doing that. Um, and so I think my, my main thing um, really is asking us how are we showing students that they can use technology and social media to make a positive difference in someone's life? We can complain about it all we want, but we have such an incredible opportunity um, to work with our young people to show them how we can use it for good. And so, thank you. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions, now is a great time. Um, those are the slides. Those are all the slides that I have. And I realized I went so quickly because I was mindful of the time here. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yes, I was able to capture a couple of questions that you didn't answer during your presentation. Uh, Susie want, wanted to know what has surprised you the most since the publication of your book? So what has surprised me the most? I, I don't know that I, I'm really surprised by this. Um, one of the things that I try to do in the book is capture the stories of, of teachers who are empowering their students to do this. What has surprised me is how I continue to hear about these great stories and I continue to meet these students mm -hmm. and that there are so many of us that are moving in this direction. I think I'm pleasantly surprised by this. I think it's such a good direction. It, I, I often talk about the analogy of you know, two roads diverging in a wood. Um, the one less traveled is the one that we're traveling, that so many of us are traveling on right now because the common road has been to ban and block um, and, and pretend that social media doesn't exist when in fact it does. And somebody asked, do you have a page for teachers for themselves? Um, Virginia might be able to clarify that question if, if she's still logged in. So one of the things that I do encourage you to do as an educator is become more involved with uh, social media for professional development. And I have on my website uh, Twitter for PD or Twitter Getting Connected with a whole bunch of resources there for educators. Mm -hmm. um, most, of the, most of the connections I've facilitated in my career really have come about from uh, Twitter connections. And then we've sometimes moved to different platforms depending on what obstacles were in our way at school. Mm -hmm. um, but, but certainly if you go to jcassata.com um, and you take a look at um, 
And you take a look at the Twitter getting connected. And also I have to say, like, you know, I have so many examples in my book. The book I think is the, well, no, I, I, I know that the book is the thickest that DVC has ever published. Um, and I had to take away 12,000 words right off the top um, because I had so many stories to, sh to share. So there are lots of examples and stories in my book as well to help support you. Great. And instruction for uh, where is the best place for elementary teachers to start when using social media in their classrooms? So one of the things um, that I also have created is social media dot, uh, socialmedia.org with mm -hmm. chapter resources. Um, I'm also just putting together a, a book, uh, an ebook for uh, teachers as well. So look for that. If you follow my blog, you'll, you'll see that. Um, but also, I've created Twitter lists for classes on Twitter. Um, and so these are, I think, uh, really important. So Twitter, I use Twitter lists quite a bit because I think that the best way to connect with teachers is to connect with teachers who are already doing some of these things. So if you go uh -huh. to my Twitter list, um, and go to classes on Twitter and connect with some of those teachers. You'll have uh, some ideas there. As well, um, I include, like, all the people that I think you should, that I talked about today, or myself, mm -hmm. like, reach out to us and we're happy to help you. EduMatch has been a, a great uh, place. If you go to at EduMatch, um, Sarah Thomas started that, and that's a great place to connect educators as well. A lot of uh, a lot of my own connections have come from that. Does that answer your question? Yes, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Virginia, did I answer your question about um, teacher instructional resources? Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I did create, I did copy another one. Can you share the most effective ways that teachers are integrating media literacy into elementary classrooms? <laughs> okay, that is not something I can answer in two minutes. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> um, there are, so, I, I think the, your best place for that, I can't remember what chapter it is off the top of my head, but there is there are mm -hmm. tons of resources on socialmedia.org. Um, if you go into the chapter around teaching and learning with media, um, there there's a hyperdoc in there. There are tons of different resources um, to, to help you. Great. Terrific. And Thanks so much for presenting today. I think everybody learned quite a lot. Um, I'm going to now turn the show over to Peggy, who will tell us about upcoming shows. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was just wonderful. And you have so many resources for us to explore. And I know that we're all going to be checking those out after the show is over. We hope all of you will come back and join us for future shows. We generally meet every Saturday, but we won't have a show next Saturday because it is the Labor Day weekend in the United States. Um, September 9th, we're still working on finalizing that show. But September 23rd, we're going to do a whole show on Adobe Spark. And Suzanne Sally will be presenting for us. September 16th, Francie Kugelman is coming back to do a whole show all about Donors Choose for Beginners, how to get started if you haven't been using it to find and fund um, things for your classroom. September 30th, Patty Harjo is coming to teach us about breakout EDU game creation. And on October 7th, we're going to have two teachers who, who teach together in a, in a fifth grade setting in Colorado. Michael Foster and Don Donahue are going to be talking about what they do with coding. So we're going to have featured co-teachers. So we're really looking forward to all those shows. And I hope you'll all come back and join us.
Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkett owns latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or take the link from the chat. There's also a tab in the Live Finder for the form. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher of the month. The video collections on iTunes U, also accessible from the Live Finder. As you exit the session, the survey link should open in your browser. If it doesn't, you can take the link from the chat or from within the Live Finder. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing, who sends these out. Uh, please make sure you s request this be sent to a personal email address, not schools, because schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest today, Jennifer Casa Todd, to Steve Hargadon founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.